Talk Radio. Welcome to the Artist Hour, everybody. Uh, we are here, joined with Zach and uh, our lovely guest. Um, he is a musician, a clothing designer, a graphic graphic designer, a internet legend, fucking mogul, <laughs> fucking all, you name it. He, this man has done it. Picture plane. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Happy to be in Austin, Texas. Welcome back. Uh, we have seen you a couple times in our lives, um, starting from 2018. That's when I first got into you. Um, you had uh, an art exhibit, and I'm not sure, was that during like South by or yeah. something? No. no, it wasn't. It was uh, in February 2018. Yeah, so we, me and Christian booked um, Horsehead and... Oh, right, right, oh, right, right. That's right. what it was. Yeah, and then... I just happened to be here at that time doing the art residency and that that GBC show happened here and oh, those wow. guys are my friends. So I invited them to come hang out at the Museum of Human Achievement. That's where the my art residency was going on. Yeah. Heck yeah. And that art and show was badass. You guys all came back to hang out after that. That shit was sick, man. That I, that shit like felt so cool. And then like I, I like got put onto your music and I was like, holy fuck, like this is like next level shit. Like You've been doing this for a really long time, so yes. could you could you walk us back like from the start, like like what what got into you like making tunes like that? Like yeah, because like you're you're a veteran. Like I've I found you probably when I was like fourteen. I found you on Tumblr. Wow. So, someone made an edit of do you know the show Skins? Yes. The UK I've never show? seen Skins, but I'm familiar with it. Yeah. So I was like really into like that fandom growing up because I fucking love that show. And I remember they were making edits to like, because Crystal Castles was on the show. Totally. And they were making edits to that music. It was like hella like super shit like that. The, the new division. And then eventually they made one of like Grimes and then they made one of you. Cool. And that's how I found out about you. And I was like 14. That's dope. I didn't, I don't really, I didn't really know that. Yeah, but you, it makes sense. Like, there's like a really big community that would like make edits to like that like era of music, like of like the like electro, like thra like Clash, electro. You know what I mean? Like, like dark electronics. Yeah, yeah with I, teens doing drugs. And yeah, yeah, literally but, like, like, glorifying pre, shit. Pre, pre Euphoria days. Exactly. Literally. Like, that was I, euphoria, euphoria. I hate to call it Witch House, but you know that's, that was that the, era. That, that was the Witch House era. Yeah, that era. So and then whenever we booked the show, this dude that we used to hang out with that did pictures. Was like, hey, do you want to pull up? I'm gonna go take pictures of the homie Travis, and he called you Travis. So I was like, I have no idea who this is. And then on the way, whenever he picked me up, he was playing your music. And I was like, dude, what the fuck? You fuck with picture playing? He's like, dude, that's who we're on the way to go meet. <laughs> that's crazy. As and fuck. like, whenever we pulled up, like low key, like I was trying not to fan out. Like I didn't even, I'm, I'm not gonna even. Well, lie. that's cool for sure. I, I was like seven. <laughs> I was like 17, and I was like, holy. No, fuck. I remember that you guys were all really young, and you know, I've. Anytime my music can connect with the youth, it's like really important to me. Yeah. I was very happy to be hospitable to you guys and, and you know, cause I was there working on all these paintings and stuff. And I was like, so just making art every day, I was happy to have you guys in there. And you know, you guys were teenagers. It was yeah. cool. I was like, hell yeah, these kids are cool. Yeah. They want to hang out. I like we're, we're just trying to, we're just trying to fucking like, like make moves like as, as early as possible. Yeah. So that's what I was like going to stem off of is like, like what, what started like your musical origins? Honestly, uh, I grew up in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is like a really interesting town. It's, um, it's always been extremely friendly to art and mm -hmm. music and like counterculture or kind of hippie vibes. Yeah there um growing up i was super into underground hip-hop that was what was like really popping in the early 2000s when i was in high school yeah like um but also like tons of like emo and all kinds of shit i was super into at the drive-in and like thursday right. these bands but That's also tight. super into record labels like anticon and def jux and stuff mm -hmm. um and that was super inspirational for me to start making my own music. I started making beats in my bedroom as a teenager on this like old Dell computer with this like weird software on a CDR that I got at Best Buy for oh, like shit. $40. Fuck. Magic's Music Maker 7. <laughs> Shout out Magic's Music Maker. So but, uh, shout out Magic. Whenever you say underground hip hop, do you mean underground hip hop like in like the sense of like atmosphere and like Jedi mind tricks? Yes, and, like, most that? definitely. I loved all that stuff. Like, okay. and that was the era, like late 90s, oh, yeah. early 2000s. There was like a really incredible wave of DIY indie rap yeah. that was like really thriving at that time. Yeah, Def Jux, Jedi Mind Tricks, Anticon. 
it, like so much stuff. I can really nerd out about that yeah. time period. It's mm-hmm. it's a really fruitful, cool time period. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, my yeah. cousin Taylor, so my uh, he used to like trade CDs and VHSs of like skate videos. He was really into like the skate video community, and like whenever we would watch those videos, that's how I got put on to like Brother Ali, Atmosphere, like Rhyme Sayers, totally, like Jedi Mind Tricks. All that shit was this. That's old cool. Skate you know videos. about that stuff because it's really old at this point and. D- at that time it was thriving but then once like the mid 2000s hit it like really kind of like got st- the music started getting really confused and it became very it's muddled kind of uncool and just kind of fell out of fashion really and i definitely like left my interests went onto other things for sure yeah. but there was like a solid chunk of time in the early 2000s where that stuff was like the shit so was this yeah. before the internet for you like was this no it was like but it was Definitely like web 1.0. This was oh, still gotcha. like yeah, yeah. there was escape era. Yes, there was no. Um, this was even like pre MySpace. I'm oh, talking fuck. About, okay. Which is, I'm old now. <laughs> 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 but this was me like when I was a teenager, like when I was really young. Got you. Um, but yeah, so I started making all this hip hop music when I was a teen, and like my friends and I started a band. We were called Thinking in Circles, and yeah. I was a rapper with my other friends and we literally called it emo rap at the time <laughs> but this was in like 2002 2003 fuck that's sick um and because it was emo cuz we were rapping about like girls and i was talking about like aliens and pyramids and <laughs> that's tight. but um and we we would play shows at this teen center in Santa Fe that was an, like basically uh, really important in my artistic development was this uh, this w- place called Warehouse 21. It was like an all ages teen center mm-hmm. that would have shows all the time of different genres of music. Uh, if you were in a band, you could play there as a as a teen. So there was like this thriving teenage scene in Santa Fe when I was in high school. That yeah. So many people were in bands. There was like all these shows all the time, and it was like the shit. You could go there and hang out. You know, there's like no drugs and alcohol allowed, but we'd still find ways to do our thing. Yeah. Yeah. It was really, really cool. And like, so I was playing shows on stage when I was like 17, like maybe even 16. Um, and honestly that really kind of kickstarted my musical like trajectory and just like love mm-hmm. of production and performing and, and all that. So you started with the, with the emo rap band, emo rap yeah. group. And then, um, so what around what time or what year did you start saying uh taking the electronic like approach like oh shit like i moved to to denver after high school in santa fe and that's like i started going to art school there to study painting basically mm-hmm. and that's when my interest really started to kind of expand beyond hip hop and i was discovering all kinds of just crazy music like Black Dice and Wolf Eyes and Lightning Bolts, all kinds of weird noise music and crazy electronic music and just like even things like Dizzy Rascal and stuff, which to me like it was like grime and like that kind of British dance music and stuff and electronic music. Yeah. The production was so much more electronic, uh, even though, you know, rap and hip hop is very electronic. It is electronic production, but... Mm -hmm just the noises and like weird styles, I became much more interested in electronic music, quote unquote. Um, So I don't know, just started getting more into that. And that's also where Picture Plane came in. It was like, that was like a new name I gave myself to start this kind of like new music I was creating at the time that was not hip hop. What was the idea behind the name? Honestly, it just came from like the, the back of like an art textbook in the index of like words like art words basically okay it's like a simple term that just means like the plane the surface plane that a, a picture sits on oh got you got the you picture plane like a flat surface damn that's badass <laughs> that's it's, a, it's like a, a real word and a real term but no one ever uses that term it's kind of like i've a, never heard an it before, obsolete yeah. term Damn, that's better. So if I'm skipping a couple of years in your timeline, feel free to correct me. Mm-hmm. But when did you open your own space in Denver? Like your own DIY um, space? You're talking about Rhinoceropolis. Yep. Sir. That was, uh, Rhinoceropolis opened in 2006 in Denver. And it was opened by some really good friends of mine um, that I knew from the art school that I was going to. Um, 
and just some other guys that were in in the music scene in Denver. Um, I didn't move in there. Actually, no, that's not true. It was like 2005 it opened maybe, and I moved in there in 2006. Okay. Um, so I wasn't one of the first few that opened it, but I was basically there at the very beginning. And like, okay. uh, <clears throat> yeah, you know, that was like also, <clears throat> at that time I wasn't even really playing shows yet, but moving into that space allowed me to have like, it was this enormous warehouse. We could be as loud as we wanted, have crazy parties all the time and throw our own shows and throw our own art shows and everything. And that really allowed me to kind of start like rehearsing or like performing basically mm -hmm. at shows. Uh, so it was really where you developed like your... Completely. Like it, it gave me the space and the time to be able to like focus on my music and just kind of like go totally crazy yeah. there was Hell yeah. no rules or anything i didn't even know what i was doing it was just like pure raw expression at that time fuck yeah i, I remember there's this video I, I don't know if it's still up it was on youtube it's old it's like 14 15 years old type shit it's like an mtv's mtv cribs parody yes and it's you giving a tour yeah. of it <laughs> and I'm that's like, cool you've seen that a lot of people tell me that they saw that which I, is neat because i thought that was so fucking sick it was like a local denver newspaper that did that and I think it was their idea to do the Cribs thing. Oh, hey, what's up? <laughs> Welcome to Rhinoceropolis. Come on inside. But obviously our, our house is so weird and it's like <laughs> a, really a cool window into our crazy world there. So it, it was cool and they edited it in a fun way with all my And I just remember stuff. being like, I was like, this is like when I was 14, 15 again. Um, I remember just being like, cause I was, I was already like into going to shows and throwing shows and being at shows and stuff like that. And I remember just thinking like that whole concept just being with people that like you not only create with, but also live with, like just being consistently on a creative like space. You know what I mean? Where there's like any opportunity, like, you know, and I'm sure like y'all hosted like a lot of like touring bands that would come stay and stuff like that too. Yeah, honestly, like it was really the dream for a while like you know looking back on it it was really beautiful to live <coughs> with um my peers who are also artists and musicians and it was just this extremely creative place where everyone was like encouraging each other all the time in their art and their work um and you, we were just living the art all the time every day 24 oh, 7 yeah. and also my rent was like 300 dollars. <laughs> <laughs> that, that'll this do was it it's like a different yeah, yeah. time you know i could afford to, to be like a, a dishwasher part time and like work on my music all the time. Hell yeah. you know, it's we so much harder to do these days. It's like impossible. I don't know. I, I feel really bad for a lot of the really young people where like, I don't know if that's even possible anymore. I don't know. That's like a whole other conversation, but you know, yeah, for real. I feel blessed that when I was really young, like it was still extreme. Denver was still really, really cheap at that time. Mm -hmm. And I know for a fact it's not anymore, you know, so I don't know. So as far as, you know, good memories that come along with it, were there any like standout like moments specifically that like you just look back fondly, like any shows or maybe like moments or anything that just like stuff that, stuff that you want to tell your kids about type shit at that spot? I mean, we had so many bands come through there that at the time, you know, were just really underground DIY bands that have be gone on to have like incredible careers now, you know, people like Dan Deacon or Future Islands, um, oh, Washed Out, Health, um, oh, damn. Lightning Bolt, Crystal Castles DJed in there. Um, I don't even know. There's like so many more. Mm -hmm. um, and those were all like just really special times and also like cool relationships um that i got to build by just having these touring bands come through my house it allowed me to build and foster these relationships with these bands like that's kind of how i started working with health who in turn got me signed to their record label at that time and that's who put out like my first album which allowed me to really go on like a world tour with health and stuff hell yeah dude kick kickstarted my career as a musician but that's all because of living in rhinoceropolis and like kind of being in that environment um, so it just that kind of networking was really valuable. Hell yeah. It's, it's really cool to like, to, to 
start from where you started and, and find those connections because those connections lead to other connections and like you have a whole group of like people that you can it's a dumb collaborate thing. with and, and it's so fucking cool. totally and it was just super like organic and and natural because like i loved the music it was all about the music for me mm -hmm. you know and also the art we were doing crazy art shows and stuff too but you know at its core i was just like a deep music fan mm -hmm. and still am so it was you know it wasn't for like clout or something we were doing yeah. we were hosting these shows because yeah we wanted to put these bands on and like at the time it was really like the only place in denver to see these kind of shows of like yeah that's what's gonna super ask. weird music like left field avant-garde type mm -hmm. underground noise chaos music you know yeah there's not many places that could do that i mean denver seems like a pretty like cool place i don't know if that yeah, was probably the is. only place the only spot that had that type of like avenue for music like that at the time there were a few others for sure denver has always had like a really kind of thriving underground music community mm -hmm. for sure and i think it it really still does i moved away from there in 2012 so it's it's been a minute since i lived in denver but my formative years as a musician were all in denver for sure okay um so so jumping from denver like because you you talk you you go to a lot of places you you go you travel a lot so I want to know like what where where did you go to after Denver as far as like the living situation wise, I moved to Brooklyn in 2012. Okay. Um, I really just kind of wanted to expand my horizons a bit. Denver was starting to feel like kind of a small bubble. I had been there many years and was looking to expand in my career and mm -hmm. my my life basically got you and it was a, a good decision i'm i'm happy that i moved to new york i was traveling to new york a lot and playing a lot of shows there and it was always just like so dope and sick. Yeah. like new york was crazy and, and i've always been really fascinated by new york city my whole life and i was mm -hmm. like why am i not living here like i had all these friends there and it was there's all these signs pointing that I needed to, to go there. there. Yeah. When, when you're growing up in Santa Fe, was it like the actual city or was it like a suburb? Like, was it quiet? Like where you lived in comparison? Well, the city of Santa Fe is pretty small. So there's not even really even suburbs of Santa Fe. Like it's a, it is a very quiet town though. Um, it's more, like, it's a small city. I don't know how to describe it. There's not really suburbs, I guess. There is, are places like outside of town mm -hmm. you can, people live kind of rural for sure gotcha. but uh yeah it's like a, a a small mountain town that's where meow wolf is right yes yeah yeah i went there that, oh that, oh that's what i was gonna bring up um before i even knew who you were i went to uh meow wolf uh for a vacation uh, we were in new mexico and um and we shot a music video. I know we're not supposed to shoot in there but <laughs> i shot a music video in there and uh um, sure, it's fine and uh there was a, a exhibit in there and it, it was like a, a little room with like a small TV. There was like like posters of like Hannah Montana and, and like shit that like that. That was my installation. Exactly, yeah. And that, <laughs> and I didn't know that. Like I, I we shot in there and then three months later, that's when I met you for the first time. Crazy. It's so weird how that works. <laughs> So like I, I wanted to ask um, like how did you get that Meow Wolf um, exhibit in there? Cause that's really fucking cool. Honestly, like the people that started Meow Wolf, I went to high school with them. Oh they're, shit! They're like local Santa Fe people that we all went to that place, Warehouse Twenty One, together, the, mm -hmm. the teen center and stuff. So they're just like you know one of the many people that are from Santa Fe that are just very interesting, unique individuals. Yeah. Um, but obviously Meow Wolf became this, like a huge collective really. Um, and I mean, now it's this massive corporation. They got it in Vegas it's now. Incred it's incredible, but yeah. it really started from very humble DIY beginnings in Santa Fe. Fuck yeah. Um, and so they gave me like a, an installation to do whatever I wanted um, at the first Meow Wolf in Santa Fe. And actually that was kind of a collaboration um, with an Austin artist named Mr. Kitty. Oh, okay. Um, him and I, like, he created some music for it, and he created this crazy character named Girl Boy that was, like, this faceless, uh, androgynous, 
like pop star basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I made all this like girl boy merch. And so the idea was that it was supposed to be like a teenager's bedroom that was obsessed with this artist girl boy. Yeah. Oh and shit. So I made all this crazy girl boy stuff like that was like inside the room and I painted the bedroom pink and it was like this kid's bedroom, but tricked out in this weird for this like fictitious ar artist girl boy. <laughs> That's so cool. I, I walked in there. It was super weird and, and but, but a lot of people loved it. Hell yeah, cause like I, I, we were just like walking around. It's a big old house for people who don't know. Meow Wolf is like a huge like art exhibit. Is, it, is each like different like setting or room like by other people too or is it? Yes, it's like dozens and dozens of different um, artists involved doing different installations. Mm -hmm. um, what Meow Wolf did though is they kind of like I don't know if they invented this, but they really were the first people to kind of have it so like people like they would charge admission, like yeah. tickets to go. And, you know, they would use that money to build like bigger and better installations. Mm -hmm. You know, normally if you go to like an art gallery or something, there's no admission. You just walk in and look, yeah. look at the paintings or something. And that's fine. But what Meow Wolf did was make it more of like this crazy interactive mm -hmm. experience. Yeah. So you're paying for this experience. And it just took off. The idea exploded. Yeah, they really show out too in there. It's it's fucking cool. And like it, it's this big old like I from what I remember, it's a huge house. And there's like it's like a fun house pretty much. Like you wa you walk yeah. into a refrigerator and you're in a whole complete different area. Like it was so like mesmerizing and it was just so crazy that I put those pieces together. Uh, it was it it, like, it treated me the fuck out like it's some real small world shit. So. Um, as far as like your installations go, I know you've traveled like all over, like you've gone to like Berlin, you've come here to Austin multiple times. Where would you say like your most like memorable place to do specifically art was? If you have one. Um, for art, I guess, uh, I got to do a really fun, um, I've done a few art residencies similar to the one I did here in Austin, um, I did one in Ghent, Belgium. Same thing. I kind of I lived there for like a month and created a whole art show within that month period. Hell yeah. I also did the same thing in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Oh, I was like working with a, a gallery there, and I was like living in this like artist hostel, and just making weird paintings every day. And then we had an art show at the end of the the, the trip. It was cool. Fuck yeah, that's badass. I had an art show in Slovakia one time. Um, <laughs> how does that, how do you make those connections? Like it's really, a lot of it is through the music. I think like okay. that I'm able to do both is, is really cool. Um, but you know, I am really trying to get more into doing more art lately. Like, uh, I don't know, you know, I, I studied art in school and stuff and I, I'd like to be more of a, a painter really mm -hmm. like full time that would be lit that'd be fucking sick as hell yeah. um so going going uh past like the artistry and the and the music i wanted to talk about alien body for a little bit sure um from what i've noticed over the years like your quality i feel like you've always taken in consideration of the quality of the garments that you make because every time i've ordered something it's like high quality and it's like it just looks like well made you really like put your like for a long time you put your heart and soul into that <laughs> and i just want to like good thank you yeah it's it's taken some years for for me to like really understand that too. You know, I think at the, the very beginning it was more just kind of like merch, you know, like mm -hmm. artist merch. That's really kind of how it started was me doing, making picture plane shirts for my shows and stuff like yeah. that. Um, but the quality is, is important for clothes, you know, and now every, it's so saturated. I feel like everyone is just making clothes all the time. TikTok. It needs to be good for it to stand out, you know. Yeah, most definitely. And um, so I like, wish I could make them even higher quality, but it's it's so expensive. Fuck yeah, making clothes is really very expensive. And it's really and, time uh, consuming too, especially sourcing good. Yes. Yeah. So what was um? So when when did you start with the alien body? And also like, where did the name come from? Like, what what was the idea behind that? At first, I was thinking of the name alien body wear. Like th there was um or alien body gear maybe they like there was this this weird old like surf company i think it's like something like something something surfwear 
and they'd make these like crazy like reflective jackets and stuff super 90s like neon like Riff Raff will wear that shit <laughs> yeah, <laughs> shout out Riff Raff hell yeah but so I was like oh like alien body wear like you know I wanted it to be like you know on your body and then like kind of a pun with an alien body or something but mm-hmm. then I just kind of shorted it maybe one of the, the first alien body shirts I think it does say alien body wear on there that oh that's sick a very rare shirt I don't know if anyone even has that anymore but yeah alien body just sounds cool you know it's tight oh yeah and i've always had interest in kind of the paranormal Mm sci-fi x files vibes is that like something that you've always been interested like even like when you were a kid yes totally like what what movies like where you like where i have an x files tattoo oh that's hard (laughs) i didn't even notice that (laughs) that's fire i remember watching x files as a kid it would just like blow my mind every week I'd watch it on Fox like at night, you know, oh, like, shit. back when it was like actually scary at those times. It's like there's this episode that's like still really famous in the X-Files lore today called Home. And it's like, oh, it's like the, the one like horror episode where Mulder and Scully go to this house of like inbred yeah. children. They're, they're, the whole family is inbred and they like keep their mom like under the bed and like have sex with their mom. What and, like, the fuck? They're like breeding a whole new family and the house is all booby trapped and they're like these mutant inbred people. And <laughs> <laughs> like, Holy shit. I saw that when it first came out and it completely blew my mind. I was like, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. And it was like on network TV. What year was it? Like what year did that come out? Uh, late 90s, I don't know, 97, 98. <laughs> I was like a kid and uh, I guess like famously after that, I didn't really know this at the time, but they got like thousands of letters of like complaints. Like, oh, I bet people like, what is this? Like, this should not be on TV. Yeah. My children saw this. The FCC were pissed. Yeah. (laughs) It was, it's really hardcore for TV. I can't believe they even put that on TV at that time. That is fucking wild. Uh, that's a good episode though. You should watch that. I need to watch that. I need to, y'all watch that shit too. It's fucking crazy. Oh, you seen it? Yeah. Oh, damn. It's season four. Yeah. Home. It's called. Fuck. Um. So like X. So you had X Files and like what? What was the other things that you were that you were watching? Uh, like movies, show wise, as 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 a kid growing up. I don't know. Like like Fire in the Sky and stuff. That that movie. It's like about it. It's a true story of these guys that get abducted in Arizona Mm -hmm. and they kind of um, this guy Travis Walton is his name it's like you can watch like lectures and talks of him talking about the the reality of the situation like it's totally a true story like he was literally abducted and his friends saw him get abducted by a UFO and he was missing for like five days and came back and yeah he they were they took him away It's like really crazy. So they made a whole movie about it, but like the movie is more like Hollywood style. They kind of made it into like a horror movie. Mm -hmm. There's these like scenes of like alien torture and shit. It's very freaky. I saw that (laughs) at a very young age too. And I was like, oh my God, this is the sickest thing I've ever seen. Yeah, that's badass. I don't know. I've always liked stuff like that. Like space horror uh, and like conspiracies, you know, strange like you know cryptozoology i love things like you know bigfoot loch ness monster those like classic kind of stuff yeah, yeah, yeah. it's always really fascinating to me when i was a kid that's badass so you so you had all that um as far as like music um movies and show wise but what about music like say like your your parents like what, what were they listening to that you like pe- like your ear perked up to or, you know weirdly like i never liked my parents music <laughs> my parents will probably not want me to hear hear me say that but like (laughs) I was just always interested in my own shit even from a really young age like Mm -hmm. elementary school I was into like Weezer and Bush and Nirvana Smashing Pumpkins yeah like I had no interest in my parents music at all (laughs) from from, this is when I'm like nine years old I also remember hearing Wu-Tang like I I remember bringing a Wu-Tang cassette tape to church I oh, used to go to this like church and I brought it to church and was like showing my friends at this church. And it's, you know, it's like into the 36 chambers, like torture. <laughs> <fuck over." laughs> so your asshole close and keep feeding you. And I was like showing this, I'm like nine years old, like <laughs> showing my friends this. And we were all just like, Oh my God, this, this is the is, coolest. Thing. Yeah. It's just like, this is, this is it, you know? Yeah. That's fucking crazy. Uh, yeah. So, you know, at a very young age, I had an interest in like, new music so mm-hmm. i was always just like seeking out new stuff. how did you find it then 
Honestly, that's a good question. I don't know. I like at the time in the nineties, I guess, you know, I would listen to the radio and stuff and like even like make like tape recordings of the radio. Oh shit. This is another thing I'm dating myself on. But it's like <laughs> back in the day you would listen to the radio and you could like press record on a tape deck oh, shit. and like make your own tapes of music. And there was uh, this like um, a college radio station in Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, that like Friday nights they would play like crazy underground hip hop. Damn. Um, and so I remember in like elementary school, like making these crazy tape recordings of like taping this radio show, and they're playing like Tribe Called Quest, Wu Tang, like all kinds of weird East Coast hip hop, Nas, and like Mob Deep and stuff, and. So I got super into hip hop. I don't know, listening to these weird radio shows and mm -hmm. shit. I don't know. It, you know, I was music was just this crazy fascination for me, like if always. Hell yeah! It, it's kind of crazy you say that because I feel like that that draws a lot of uh, parallels to how I found you. Truth be told, because like I found you like in an era that I was like whenever I was like super submerged in internet culture, like as a whole, like it was like whenever I was getting into like Space Ghost, Perp, Young Lean, Blade, mm -hmm. Friend Zone, like Crystal Castles, Tycho, yeah. stuff like that, you know. And I feel like it was like almost like a domino effect. Like I found Space Ghost, Perp, then I found Young Lean through him, and like by then I found Friend Zone, and by by finding Friend Zone, I found like Grimes and you and Alice Glass and stuff like that. Totally. And I feel like through like those channels because like growing up like I wasn't really like a super super social kid and I feel like no one except like him and a couple others like understood like stuff that wasn't aside like the radio stuff yeah. that like you know was like embraced by the culture at the time because I feel like during like the era that I was finding all this stuff it was really like you know it was 2014 so it was real like Lana Del Rey the sure. 1975 you know stuff like that and so I, I never had like anyone to like besides them but they're already in high school at the time uh you know relate to that and so i was always on the internet just talking to people like on twitter and stuff like that and i remember friend zone retweeted this was like whenever i first first found you friend zone retweeted i'm trying to remember what song it was it was a remix i think it might have been a health remix he retweeted that and that's whenever i got like super super into you like i like knew who you were already and i already was already a bigger fan of health at that point and i was already fucking with like alice glass and shit and like that was whenever i got turned into like a super fan and that was like 20, amazing 14 15 maybe i mean that's what's so special about music it's like you don't have to you can discover it on your own you know mm -hmm. it you can go down these wormholes and rabbit holes like of self-discovery through music you know and uh, that's why like i just you can like live in like the smallest town ever or like you know be like totally like a social outcast or like whatever but like the music you can like find yourself through yeah the, like just music and discovery that way exactly yeah. and you can also meet other people online that share your interests and stuff that way you know mm -hmm. it's, subculture is is really beautiful that way yeah and like you were everywhere at that point like even like in like like a couple years just like down the road like whenever i was listening to like like gbc and stuff like you found your way into like that sound too like you're hanging out with like little ugly man and antoine like you found your way into like other pockets aside from your initial blow up in my eyes like how i found you like you found i think what you know at its core like even though i i've my music is like very it's electronic and kind of like dance music mm -hmm. influenced and stuff like at my essence like i'm still like that kind of like young hip-hop teenager yeah. kid at and heart at heart for sure and so you know when like oh my god little ugly man i mean like you know that shit was so ill you know and i actually knew him before even Lil ugly main was around like uh just through the kind of noise scene we had mutual friends um and uh yeah shout out travis yeah for real the travises but same, <laughs> same with um with with gbc you know when i first really like heard that shit i think it was really like horsehead that i first heard um that kind of like, and then I heard Lil Peep and stuff. Uh, I remember first hearing Lil Peep, like his voice, and I was just like, 
that's it. This is ill. Like this yeah. kid is really talented. And I, I DM'd him. I was like, dude, your voice is fire. Like mm -hmm. this is amazing. And he hit me back. He's like, dude, I love your music too. Like what's up? Uh, and so, you know, I was just always had my ear to the ground of kind of, I, my interest in it was, was like, whoa, these kids are like singing over beats, you know, I was like, yeah. this is like, I feel a connection to this cause that's what I'm doing. Like they were way more kind of hip hop than I was, but it was like, it was musical and it was singing, you know, over yeah. electronic music, and which is what I was doing. So he's, I was like, yeah. he's yeah. really appreciative of the culture. Whenever he was still here, he was still, he was very appreciative of the culture, like all aspects. Like I remember he was, a, I remember he was a really big Clams Casino fan and like he had really, really uh, broad and like varied taste. And I remember this was, I think early 2017, you had a show in Houston at numbers yes and that went from being that show was important because it actually was the first time that i think even all, all of gbc had really been together I yeah think, um, mm -hmm. yeah this this guy nate beavers in houston put that all together and that was the first time i ever met a lot of those guys including peep and i think it was the first time even some of them were meeting each other which is mm -hmm. crazy to think about it's the internet yeah um but yeah Awesome so, show, legendary. That started as a picture plane and Wickaface right show. It was just like only a couple members in it. Gradually grew to where most of them ended up pulling up, right? I th I don't really remember, but I know that Peep wasn't announced. He was like a secret guest. Mm -hmm. Oh shit! That I didn't even know that he was gonna be there until the day of the show. They were like, "Oh yeah, Peep's coming out." I was like, "Cool, I'm excited to meet him." Mm -hmm. But um, he wasn't on the bill or anything. Maybe it was just Wickaface and me, and I don't, I don't, I can't remember, but everyone was there. It was cool. Yeah, because I remember like it being like a, like what the fuck, like I remember like, all like everyone was talking about that for a long time, especially like locally, like they were just like, how the fuck did that manage to happen without you know crazy promotion? You know what I mean? Because like it's because that dude Nate Beaver is like he is this like super gifted uh, tattoo artist in Houston, and mm -hmm. I think he just loves the music and. I don't know. He just put it on like out of his own pocket, basically, like flew us out there to do this Damn. show. And yeah, you know, he's not like a proper promoter or something. Mm. He just was like, I love this music. I want to see you guys yeah. play. Hell yeah. It was so it was like really like authentic and cool in that way. It's just like very underground. But I don't even know if people that many people knew about it, really. Yeah, no, um, I found out probably a day or two before um were you his, there did you not his cousin went and this dude that we used to hang out with they they made the drive like the morning of cool like they were like do you want to i go? was so jealous and i was like <laughs> i had some shit going on i was like nah and they made the super last minute trip but i remember what was it i want to say it was, it was early 17 right 2017 yes so Around that time, were you more focused on, because whenever I met you, at least in my opinion, you were more focused on like the art at that time. Around that time period, at least from what I've noticed and whenever I was listening to you, like I noticed there was kind of some gaps in your releases. Were you focused on music during that time? Well, or? the thing is like my picture playing, it takes time to make the music, like because mm -hmm. I'm doing all the production myself as well. Yeah. And so... I can be a little slow in that way. It's like there, there are like big gaps between my music, but it's like, or my albums, but it's maybe kind of old school in that way. Like I, to me, like an album is like this, like a really finished piece of like, Most definitely. like a statement that yeah. you're trying to make. With basically. layers to it. And um, so it kind of takes a while for me, especially if I'm like busy touring or traveling um, for me to really sit down and like start, writing the record it it can take a little while um and sometimes i'll take breaks and yeah i have other shit going on between my art or alien body or something yeah um i actually kind of feel fortunate that i can bounce around my mental focus onto different uh different things just besides music yeah um, oh yeah it gets overwhelming too when you when you you have such a creative mind you want to do everything at the same time yeah. so can you like talk to us about that like how how do you mentally prepare yourself to focus on certain things at a certain time instead of everything all at once and like going crazy. Cause that creative draw is real. Most definitely. And you I don't know. Like I'll kind of <laughs> just like, Wing it, it does help to focus on 
one thing at once though. Like right now I'm really like in the zone with my music. Like I'm working on all this new music right now, which feels really, really good. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of where my head is at. But I don't know, like sometimes I'll be focusing on my paintings or like working on like an art show and like all my energy is going into that or like working on a new collection of clothing and like therefore like spending my days like designing, doing that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. so, but I'm always like, you know, it's never just only one thing at once. I am weirdly able to work on multiple things at once. Yeah. So I can kind of com compartmentalize that, but it's, I don't know how I do it. <laughs> it's, it's impressive. I'll say so that. <laughs> you said you're working on new music. This, yes. this, this new side Whole new album. Yeah. Yes. Th this new project that you're Well, there's on. the new side project and also a brand new picture plane okay. is coming out. Oh, hell yeah. That I'm super excited about. I'm definitely making a new record right now. So, so let's but talk uh, about the new side project first, because I, I I love this this whole dungeon aura yeah. that you're going for. I love the darkness behind it. It reminds me of like not black metal. It's not the right word, but just like that overall feeling of like gloom and just like ambience and just black metal has been very inspirational to me the past couple of years. I mean, I've always really been interested in black metal, but, but like I've gotten way more into it lately the past few years and like mm -hmm. um that's also kind of how i got into dungeon synth you know dungeon synth is kind of this weird offshoot of black metal um it's fucking sick it's like black metal aesthetics but it's like ambient fantasy synth yeah. you know i like mm -hmm. it a lot it's very cool it's fun I and like it a lot. i also have been playing tons of magic the gathering and even dungeons and dragons now with some friends and so it's like those kind of fantasy themes and ideas have kind of seeped their way into this project of, of scythe that I'm doing that is like completely different than picture plane, but it's a way for me to explore some new sonic territory. And yeah, stuff. dude. Cause I was listening to it. Um, you, you started what, like 20, like releasing it, what, 2022 or earlier than that. I don't even remember. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know. Cause I, I looked at the, the Spotify and it, it said like 2022. Probably. Yeah. yeah it's yeah, around that's, that. That's about right. Um, but I was like listening to it like, um, while I was like working on a car or whatever at, at my job site. And, um, I was like, Whoa, like I was like fully immersed. Like I was like, just like imagining things. And I guess it's like, that's the essence of what dungeon synth is, is like, you're in that like imaginative state. Definitely. It's meant to create an atmosphere or like a sense of place really, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. like, that's what I get from it. I love, um, I've always loved ambient music and I, I love new age music and stuff. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm also not really making real, like authentic dungeon synth. The stuff I'm doing, it's more different. It's kind of like dungeon vapor wave or something. Yeah. Like I, I don't want to say, I don't want to consider myself like a black metal, like enthusiast, but like, I feel like it, I feel like the elements are like, it's like a mesh of like Leyland Kirby. I don't know if you know who that is. He goes by the caretaker now. That's like his mm. bigger persona. I don't but know. But he, um, he's an ambient artist. Oh, and cool. so like his um, albums, they're ambient, but they tell a story. Like, for example, one of his albums, um, We Drink to Forget the uh, Coming Storm. It's like, it, it says the ambience of you being in um, uh, things by the, by the water. I forgot what they're called. The towers. I forgot what they're called. The sea tower things with the lights. Lighthouse, I guess. Oh, Lighthouse. Um, you're in that, and the sea storm's towers. coming. Yeah, and, <laughs> and you're just watching it, and there's nothing you can do about, like, the oncoming storm. And it's essentially, like, you're alone in a dimly lit room, and it tells a story without any lyrics, essentially. And that's, like, the same energy that I was getting from this like, from this new project. Is it, like, it, like, almost... It encapsulates it almost, Yeah, it almost physically puts me in a location. Like Amazing. That's That's good to hear. I, you know, I spend a lot of time on it, and it's... I want it to be like transportive, you know, to it's psychedelic music. Man. It is, bro. Like it, 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 it blew me away. I'm not going to lie. Like, cause I, I, I'm not super like into dungeon synth, but I, I love like video game OSTs and stuff like that. And it just totally. reminded me of like Diablo or something like yeah. in like a, in the tunnel or something like it was, it was crazy. Like, so like, is that like what you, you, you go a, for? There's a crossover there for sure of, of, you know, I think modern dungeon synth, like dungeon synth has been around since the nineties, mm -hmm. but like the new dungeon synth stuff, I think that it's very much video game inspired, mm -hmm. very much like there's, it's not like straight up black metal darkness, yeah. you know, it's all these different influences at one. There's even different styles like 
comfy synth and like the, these very more like sunlit type genres that are like happy and like you know like a very like outdoors it's, you're not in the dungeon anymore you're in like a grassy area <laughs> level or something like that yeah. yeah yeah maybe it's like computer game or like video game levels so yeah. Um, we, we talked about music and uh, movies like back when you were a kid. So were you a gamer at all? Like, were you like, is that you take inspiration for some of the games that <laughs> oh, that's a cool sound. That was, that was some ASMR. I feel like during the Lone Star, I feel like uh, Matthew McConaughey in True Detective <laughs> where he's like talking with the police, you know, and like he's got a six pack of Lone Star. That's like, tight. Chain smoking. Some cigarettes. real Texas shit. That's some real Texas shit. Shout it out Matthew McConaughey for the one time. He, oh, my God. You're coming on the podcast eventually. <laughs> um, I love Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, he's fucking dope. That character in that show specifically is so amazing. Cri- Christian, uh, the uh, the other guy in there, he uh, <laughs> he has a, he has some beef with Matthew McConaughey. He uh, it tried to meet him like when he was younger. Then Matthew McConaughey pretty much like blew him off. <laughs> Dude, my my um, my sister used to live in Austin for a long time, and mm-hmm. her ex boyfriend like he told me this really funny story that like. I don't know what the context was, but somehow Matthew McConaughey, he like pissed off Matthew McConaughey somewhere. They like, and <laughs> Matthew McConaughey called him a pussy willow <laughs> in like a derogatory way. Like, what the fuck? What even is a pussy? You're just a pussy willow, <laughs> you know, in his voice. I, I was like, what? what That's fuck? crazy. Like, okay. It's so funny, dude. Pussy willow. Like I a love- bird? Yeah. What the fuck? <laughs> I, I actually don't know, but it's fucking hilarious. That's funny as fuck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he, apparently he's, he's kind of mean sometimes, but damn, he's a good actor. So <laughs> maybe just in character all the time. It's Who so knows? Funny. So speaking of Texas, I've seen a lot of videos on the internet past and not really present, That's, but I've seen a lot of old South by footage of you. Like I saw one mm. of you in a barbecue shirt. You're, it's like one of those white t-shirts, like the bikini that people wear at a barbecue in. And this was like 2011 or 2012, you were down here. Totally. How many South Bys have you, would you say that you've done or participated in? I actually don't know, but I think that I went to maybe like, definitely like six or seven in a row. Oh, shit. Like a, a long time. I would come here every year, basically. Um, that t-shirt, I remember it specifically because um, it's like a one of those like Myrtle Beach or like Miami Beach shirts. It's yeah. Like a, huge t-shirt that has like a, a girl's like boobs and like or like a, <laughs> a bikini on it basically that's tight and one time in new york city i was like i got c- arrested for doing graffiti which basically i was just like drawing a smiley face on a sign and this cop fucking arrested me Fuck. i had to spend the night in jail and i was wearing that shirt <laughs> um with the, the fucking boob, the boobs on it Fuck. and even the cops were in there they're like i can't believe you're fucking wearing that shirt <laughs> i was like well, i almost want to let well, you I, was go. In, I was in i was anticipating on getting in arrested the hold, holding cell with all these other guys and they're just like laughing at me and staring at me you know <laughs> It was insane. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah. The cops are like, I almost want to let you go right now. <laughs> <laughs> They're just like, what the hell are you doing, man? I was like, what the hell? I, you know, fucking smiley face on a sign. <laughs> that's fucked that up. That was whack. But that t-shirt was definitely got some looks in jail. That's for sure. <laughs> Fuck Were you face. ever a part of the, <laughs> of the graffiti community? I remember we went. I remember Coldy was busting hella tags when we went. Oh, Totally. No, um, I've always loved graffiti, though. You know, it, it, like anything that's hip hop culture, I was always super into it. But um, I was never like a deep graph head or any sort of like graffiti crews or anything. Like, mm. even though I'm an artist, like I never really took graffiti seriously like that. I always mm-hmm. thought it was kind of funny, like graffiti beef and shit, like <laughs> yeah. people fighting and crazy. Especially in New like, York, that shit's yes, serious like, there. It's super serious, and I respect that a lot, but. I'm super interested and like fascinated by graffiti culture actually, but mm-hmm. I was never like in it deep, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So going, going back to, so we're circling back from the start. Uh, so Santa, comparing Santa Fe to New York, like as far as living, like living wise, like how different is it? Like, I'm sure it's like night and day in comparison, but totally. like, I want, I want to know like, like, like what, what drew you to New York and, um, like just like what do you feel like when you're living in there because people say it's like magical and i just want to know like a double confirmation if it is or not i think a big part of my fascination with new york growing up was my interest in hip-hop music Mm -hmm. you know like i loved east coast shit like 
um, you know, just listening to like Cannibal Ox and stuff. I don't know if you guys are familiar with mm-hmm. that. It's like just some of the sickest like New York City shit ever. And like Company Flow, which is like LP's group, LP from Run the Jewels. Actually, okay. You know? but, like okay. When, when he was first starting out, he had this project called Company Flow. And it's like they released this like sick album called Fun Crusher Press in, in 1997. Mm-hmm. And uh, to this day, it just sounds like the most futuristic m- music ever still. Like I, I bump that shit all the time still to this day. Hell yeah. And I don't know. I just like had this fascination with like the grittiness and like the, the whole like world of like underground New York, like what that was, like what that represented in my head mm-hmm. and as like a kid. I was also super into like like fucking Ninja Turtles and shit, or like how, <laughs> how they would like portray New York City in movies and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just always really fascinated by it. And yeah, I'm like a kid from the desert in like the mountains. Like that was not my reality. Yeah. But I would like fantasize about living in like a fucking alleyway or something. Like, <laughs> being in like, the city. Yeah, yeah. Being in the city. Yeah. That's cool as fuck. Speaking about Ninja Turtles real quick, I ha- did you see the newest one that came out? Yeah, it's pretty cool. Dude. That shit's badass. The, I, I love yeah, that. the animation is really good. Me, me and me and Zach went to go see it, and then we're just ripping the pen inside yeah. inside the movie theater. Just I, like I just wow. love, I just love the homages to New York and that movie, like from their lingo to like the like little landmark references. It was just yes. a very New York movie. Totally. There's, New York is such a huge part of the Ninja Turtles. I think like it's their home. Their entire world is New York, you know. Mm-hmm. That's what the, like the first Ninja Turtles movie like really captures it so well. The live action one or the live action? Yeah, movie. that shit tripped me out. It's from like 1990 or 91. Mm-hmm. They just like knocked it out of the park. I think when like after the movie had been made, like they were even trying to make it not come out because they're like this movie is too dark. They're like this is not a kids movie. Yeah, yeah. for real. But it ended up being hugely successful. Mm-hmm. But it's one of the reasons why it's so sick is that it's like so fucking real and like, gritty yeah. it's so gritty it like matches the comic books completely and then the second movie with like the ooze and the vanilla ice and stuff they made it <laughs> way more cartoonish kind of oh yeah so kind of like how the new york how new york affects the ninja turtles would you say your living situations affects your creative output i think new york city definitely has like a a real energy that is palpable that's like creative juices just flowing through that city i mean look the whole history of new york it's like fascinating from so many different eras and even you know even in like the 1800s and 1700s that place is like fucking crazy There's yeah so much shit has gone on there's so much history it's, it's, there. it's a cultural hub yes and there is some sort of like vortex or like energy vortex there like right in that harbor there that's like a nexus of energy for sure. Mm-hmm. So it's it is an inspiring place to me and it's it's definitely rubbed off on my my music and art and stuff, you know. I can't really claim that I'm like a New Yorker or something, but I have lived there a while now. It's like over a decade. It's yeah. so it's definitely my home for sure. So like you're the the borough that you lived in, have you always lived in like the same like vicinity? Like have you seen it change into like something different yeah i've lived like in the same spot this the whole time i've lived there in bushwick brooklyn i've like seen oh, you live in bushwick like the neighborhood kids like grow up which is, oh shit like, <laughs> i've been there so long that like i remember these like little kids running around and now they're like adults damn insane. that's that's trippy. fucking wild and they'll like it's crazy i I know them they're like kids and name on the block it's like what's up you know yeah and i've seen them like their whole life it's fucking weird so uh we had sextile on like uh, pretty recently and they and they they talk about their love for new york as well and ev- they said that like you you get wrapped in other people's routines like you see the same people like every day like walking down the street and like is that something that happens to you as well like you see the same people like at a at a grocery store or something like that or like that is true but also what's cool about new york it's like this city that is in this constant state of flux all the time like people are always in motion there and people come and go quite quickly you know Mm -hmm you can live there for a while and then people just move away or like, you know, and then new people move in. It's like this constant flow of people all over the place. Mm -hmm. 
but yeah, you can like stay in your neighborhood. You're going to see the same people the around same, the yeah, block for sure. Totally makes sense. Speaking of, you know, people coming in and out of New York and cultural, cultural hubs. Um, have you like delved into like the new New York underground, like Xavier So Based, Fresh Boy Swag, Netspend, like the new East Coast? Yes, totally. Um, I don't know all those artists you just said, but, um, you know, like the surf gang shit and like, Oh, you got you, got you. Um, yes, there is definitely like a whole new wave of shit going on in New York that, you know, isn't just hip hop based. There's all kinds of like incredible young bands in New York, like, um, and like crazy DJs, very Gen Z like Mm -hmm. freaks that are the the coolest. Hell yeah. Yeah. Um, the cue. <laughs> so yeah, I'm I'm definitely like you know I I love it too you know yeah. like because a lot of them are influenced by like that era of like you and Alice Glass and Health and like Tycho like they're very inspired by like that era you know like like the, I don't want to use Tumblr as another reference but like just like that time period of just like it's almost like a new renaissance you know it's like it's coming full circle you know how like I wonder I I feel like a lot of those people or like younger artists like i don't even think that they know my music they, at all they do they sure do 100%. They, 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 so i really don't know if they do like, no they they do i've been around a lot of those kids and they listen to snow strippers and surf gang and they know because surf gang like graham pays his flowers like he gives artists his flowers that he's inspired by graham's a really cool dude he went by deliver the crush he's a he has a really good repertoire and like He's been around like forever. He knows his shit. Cool, cool. But but they definitely show love to you, Alice Glass, fucking Sextile, fucking everyone. But they definitely, it's like it's coming full circle. Like it's crazy. Like they're very very inspired by like that era and y'all. And that's why I was asking if, if you checked them out or not because they definitely show love. Snow to strippers y'all. are lit for sure. Fuck like, yeah. Their music is very good. And when I was like really first hearing them, I was like, whoa, this really sound, it honestly reminded me of my own music a little bit from like way back in the day yeah. like mm-hmm. i don't want to say it sounds like me but it was like the same kind of energy or something yeah 1000 like, hell yeah i could great. totally and, see and they that. and they give me like that like it reminds me of y'all too because of that hunger that they have like whenever i first yeah, saw really them good. live like i so i knew him because he was deliver the crush but tati just started singing like recently and whenever they came for south by last year i was telling all of them i was like, I was like give we it have si- to go i was like give it six months they're gonna blow the fuck up Word. i was like Uzi feature I, I was like just give me a sec that's crazy yeah like, I, literally. I i called that shit because i saw the resemblance in y'all like y'all because that people were like yearning for that sound again I think it makes sense. I think, you know, a lot of the kind of like you could call it like the SoundCloud wave. I think Mm -hmm. things can get kind of uh, monotonous or like stagnant. You know, there there has to be forward motion and growth in sound, you know, Mm -hmm. and I think people are wanting new sounds yeah. exactly I, I think sure. i think when COVID happened it put a line in the sand people were either going to embrace the future or be stuck in the past because like there's like during COVID, there was like the whole like hopper uh, hyper pop scene like you know like there was like like alice gas for example like the name is literally a tribute to alice glass you know like 100 gex for example like i feel like that's all inspired by y'all and i feel like it's like a mesh of you know years worth of culture coming together in COVID, you know, everyone was stuck in their rooms researching this culture, you know, and being able to embellish that and embrace it in a way that, you know, makes totally. it a mature a mature combination to where it's like very balanced, where it's not just rap or it's not considered electronic. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's and what balance. and what you said too about going full circle, because like I was listening to like Bass Nectar, Crystal Castles, like all these like EDM, like dubstep ass stuff thing, and back in like 2010, 2011, and now like I feel like that sound is like recycling back because people like realize like part of it's like kind of like a nostalgic sound, but also part of it's like oh shit like this shit was popping back then. Why is it not popping now? And then they make their own and mold their own like take on it. And that's fucking cool as shit. I feel like like artists like Snow Stripper, Doss, like those kinds of artists are filling in like a void that was gone from like 2017 to like 2020 because everyone wanted to be a rapper. I know. I, and I think there's so much music that I think a lot of kids like that were only interested in, rap music or like soundcloud rap like me guilty like bro, yeah there's so much stuff that they were missing out on exactly uh, of different genres that were so good that like if you're only focused on one thing or one genre and like that's your whole 
reality or your whole like identity you know like a thousand percent. you're you're kind of missing out on a lot dude that was me like from like 2014 to 20 like 18 like i was just obsessed with just like underground rap like bones and etc and all that shit yeah. nothing wrong with that totally because I, 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 I fucking music, love bones know? like like that would always be one of my favorite artists of all time but uh like finding music like like you i heard techno technomancer and it fucking blew me away and i'm like what the fuck i was like because i was listening to like that dubstep stuff like back in the day but like this is like you take electronic you take avenues from rap singing like electronic music dubstep you take there's like so many different genres meshed into one that yeah. makes it your your own and, and, and i just want to change my life i just want to say cool, yeah you. i just want to say technomancer is a fucking masterpiece thank you like that record is cool because like Going back to when I was a teenager, I had mentioned their record label Anticon. Mm -hmm. um, they were like this really incredible like collective that was releasing, in my opinion, some of the best like avant-garde hip hop ever made. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was a kid, like I was like obsessed with this record label, and they ended up releasing my record uh, Technomancer, which was oh, like cool. kind of this cool full circle thing, like for me as just like a my like a personal thing like wow i got to release a record on anticon and, and it, it shows like, it was like this big kind of personal milestone for me it, it, it shows Even though they're a very underground label you know mm -hmm. it wasn't like some huge major label thing or something but shout out to anticon i'm so i'm sure i'm sure it felt like a fucking huge deal to you too yeah, when it, it, was, came out. it was sick i was like proud of myself like my teenage self would have been stoked Oh yeah, I remember uh, being obsessed with the Joyrider music video. Yeah, <laughs> you were just yeah. like posted up. I was like, damn, this shit's sick. Like, I, I was like, I was bumming that shit all the speaking time. Speaking of your influence, I feel like I might have DM this to you before. I don't know. I have really bad memory, but I don't know if you know this, but people have copied shots from your music video like for I'm Like, shout out Theophilus London. Theophilus London's very fire, but he jacked your swag for that shit. <laughs> he, 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 so he did some shit wow. with he did some shit with Virgil Abloh and they I'm went dead. to the same junkyard that you went to and there was like a car crusher in a garage. Do you do you remember that? Well in the Joyrider video, yes. Yeah. I, yeah. Don't, I don't know about the Theophilus London video. Yeah. Well so they were doing like some kind of like I don't know if it was like a campaign or what it was. You but they they, out, they, they used the same like setting and like there's very, very similar shots. Crazy. Like eerily similar. <laughs> Pay the man. Not <laughs> playing. <laughs> so whenever you were making like these bodies of work, did you go into it like, hey, I'm releasing this through Anticon, it needs to be because it's it's a very like consistent project. Like there's no like skips. Like it's a very like it flows very naturally. Like Well, like I don't know. I'll be like making a record and then for that one, for example, like I kind of just hit up the the guys at Anticon, I was like, hey, would you like to put this out? Like, mm -hmm. I, I'm finishing this record soon, or like, I have this album, do you want to release it? Mm -hmm. So, and they're like, okay, let's do it. That, that's how that kind of worked out. Hell yeah. And same for like my last record, 100% Electronica, you know, they're a really great label run by George Clanton. And oh, fuck. I had like, was making this whole record and kind of just sent it to them. I was like, Hey, would you want to maybe put this record out? Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah, let's do it. Is that how that goes? Like I, I've, I've not really, that's oh, okay. not normal. Maybe I, you know, because I have been around a long time, the, these artists, they already knew who I was. You know? Okay. I, I wasn't just hitting them up out of the blue. Like, cause it is really hard. Like it's not so easy to just have a, a label, like put out your music. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And I know that from firsthand experience too, like, they they have to either already be really like fucking with you or like have some sort of pre-existing relationship yeah there or something got you okay or uh, now a lot of labels they they want your numbers to be like huge already even before mm -hmm. you're even signed and that's the crazy is, thing it's, yeah. it's kind of shitty like you know there's no artist development yeah they well the labels they'll want the artist to be already popping online before they're even signed isn't that the record labels like due diligence right. to, to make them that's right. how it's supposed to be but that's what i thought labels will want that what that work to be done for them already now. well i guess because it's the age of the internet too that's what i was like i'm trying to like i wish i like grew up in the 90s because like i wanted to know like how difficult it actually was to stand out like because like now you can just make a funny tweet and be a fucking mega star in the next 24 hours like it's it, it's so crazy how that works and i just want to know like if that is like someone who grew up like in the early 2000s like how different the landscape is nowadays in comparison Dude, to back then it was so different it like the 
the music that I was into as a teenager, it was ex- like explicitly anti-mainstream. Mm-hmm. Like now, like the underground, they're rapping about like cars and money and shit and like uh, yeah. getting paid, you know. Fucking at, like, bitches. <laughs> that was stuff that only mainstream rappers used to talk about. Yeah, most definitely. The indie rap back in the day was explicitly like anti-corporate, anti-consumerist, mm-hmm. like it was like raw art and that was what it was about, you know. It's like anti-establishment. It, so, yeah, it was way more punk in that way. Hell yeah. It was like this is like this cool. is not about mm-hmm. selling records. This is not about getting chicks. This is like about my own like weird personal art that I'm making, you know. Yeah. Grievances. And for better or worse, that is what it is. I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm just saying that's like it did. There was this crazy flip with like underground. I guess it's more hip hop, I guess, going back Mm -hmm. to like in rap. I don't know how that really happened, but that flip of like the underground became very like commercial or like wanting just to be about like going viral and getting as much money as possible it kind of happened overnight it was it did not used to be that way hell yeah that's that 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 is weird now that i think about it and like i've been listening to a lot of like um like texas rap like houston rap and shit like that and even like back in the 90s they were also like really like ugk for example all their bars are very like anti-establishment like anti like government and shit like that i'm like whoa what the fuck like these people are like were on that shit back then even in, in the 90s, a lot of those guys, too, like, th- they were not really thinking that they were ever going to be, like, mainstream or, yeah. like, on MTV or something like that. I could definitely see that because, like, they, they were just – like, it sounded like they were just having fun. Like, it's, like, East Coast rap, West Coast, like, Houston rap. They were just doing it just to do it. Yeah. And, like, I feel like people – People are doing it now to just like, oh, I need to, I need to blow up. I need to do something, yeah. the next big thing or something like that. And it's just, it's just crazy, like how the how the landscape is is making is music now. to just with like the sole intention of trying to go viral or like blow up. You know, I feel like you're you're doing it wrong, really. Like this, yeah, making music for the wrong reason. Exactly. It should be coming from a place of like of passion and heart, and like you should be doing it because you're really, really passionate about it Mm -hmm. there's not a lot of money in music to be made unless you do get lucky and somehow get really popular yeah but that's not really the norm that's like a that's more rare yeah so trying to like sell out from like immediately like trying to like make as much money as possible like going Mm -hmm. viral or something i don't know you're i feel like you're gonna regret it and the long run, after. Yeah. yeah, it's it's not sustainable. Or like, yeah, maybe you do go viral, and then then like, you have to make I, the next album. Then like a year later, no one fucking cares about you. Yeah, you literally, know? it's it's like, so hard to the the main the, the maintaining relevancy well, also, aspect of it. The consumer attention span, I feel like, is really low too now because everything's so readily available. Totally. You know, because I feel like if you like you listen to like one artist song, you know, if, you don't, if you don't fuck with it, you move on, and they're in the back of your brain, and like that's the end of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's always someone doing something, not better. That's not the right word, but there's always there's always someone filling in that that niche void for someone. You know, it's not going to always be like that, you know? Yeah. And, sp- and sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, you're good. S- speaking, speaking of the relevancy, like um, for you exam- as an example, I feel like you personally like don't care about maintaining relevancy, but you just do it. Like you, you've been relevant for almost fi- like 15 years now. And I just want to know, like, it, that's not something you do you even think about or it's just like you just do what you do. I mean, of course I think about it because, I mean, it is my career. It's my life, you know, mm-hmm. I think, you know. Um, yeah, but it's, it's not something that's like super fun to think about. Like, yeah, most it's not definitely. like I'm like sitting there like, Oh, how do I stay relevant today? You know, but that's how social media works, which it's like, it's shitty. It's like, you're always kind of clamoring for attention or, or like you're wanting people to like, if you're not getting enough likes or views, you're like, Oh my God, no one cares about me or something. You mm-hmm. know, that's common things that can go through your mind as an artist for sure yeah definitely go through that but you know i try not to not think about that all the time and just really focus on making good art you know mm-hmm. 
but it can be frustrating sometimes for sure. Hell yeah. And that, that's cool that you keep a level head about it most of the time. I mean, cause like I, I've, I fell victim to that. Like, I'm like, fuck, like I dropped this song only has like 300 plays. I'm, I hate this shit. Fuck this. Like, I'm, you know, but like I'm lately I'm, I'm way better at like, just like going with the motions and like just continuing it and like if it picks up it picks up type deal and now like with this whole podcast and we're interviewing artists and stuff and like having them uh artists like show like share their stories and their life and stuff like that i feel like that's something that people are like always want to like listen to and having you on here is like is really cool it's kind of like a like a uh a check in the bucket list here because like you're, you're fucking cool as shit. And thank you guys. And um i wanted to ask you a couple more questions before we before we send this off sure sure um so as far as like artistry and music and whatnot, um, where do you see yourself in the next like three to five years as far as like goal wise, aspirations, new music, touring? Well, hopefully this year I will be putting out like a, a new record, I think probably later this year. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a whole new direction for me. It's like even way more goth kind of dark wave oh, yeah. music. Um, I'm kind of singing in a different style. Um, I'm really excited about that actually. Hell yeah. That's badass. Um, and yeah, I want to just be making more art. You know, I, I want to be painting more. Like I said earlier, I think my, my dream is to just be like a dude that just paints. Do you, um, are, do you have any like for sale, like, like any prints or is it, is there something you want people to see like in person, like in an exhibit? I don't really have prints for sale. It's mostly just paintings basically. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I do have some prints sometimes for sale. I don't know. It depends. Just people got to stay on my Instagram or something. Mm, totally. So do you have any tips for any new artists, like regardless of the genre, like just any general tips? Maybe going back what I was saying before of like, you know, not trying to get famous overnight. Mm -hmm. You know, things don't happen right away. Like you have to really, it takes, it could take years to, to build up like, you know, your artistry or to like get good at something. Yeah. You don't just all of a sudden start out making beats and all of a sudden you're the shit. You know? Yeah, that, exactly. That's not how it works really. Like, yeah, you can be extremely talented, um, but it takes a long time to really start honing your craft. And like, you need to be patient. Like I think for new artists, like don't get discouraged if you're not making mad money when you're 20 years old, you know, like mm -hmm. you have to really put in some work, like real hours and like real yeah. years even for it to really start being fruitful. You're gonna have to struggle a little bit. Yes. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like struggling is beauty, beautiful. Yeah. Like, you know, I agree. good art comes out of struggling mm -hmm. like that. Like you have to really want it and you have to really uh, be passionate about it. Hell yeah, man. That That's like the best advice I've ever heard. Honestly, that's, that's, that's fucking badass. It's, it's real for sure. I, you know, I, I lived it like, I don't know. I, I only got to where I was because I like really, really wanted it. Mm -hmm. It's like really grinding in the underground for a long time. Hell yeah, man. And it, 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 it shows dude. Cause like you, you have this whole operation going like with the alien body with picture plane with now like scythe, you have like all these different avenues that people can like reach you at. And it's just like, super like uh it, it, it brings like motivation inspiration to me and like i know like hundreds of other people too so we really appreciate you man and um yeah, is, thank you guys for having me of on, course dude. is there any last words you want to say to the, the picture plane supporters alien body wearers anything <laughs> <laughs> no i don't know shout out austin texas Woo. shout out long star here shout yeah. out matthew mcconaughey yeah. this has been an artist hour we're sending us off right shout out picture plane we'll see y'all later bye bye <laughs> Yeah.